When I was a young boy, I used to spin the globe and let my finger stop on any country and dream of one day exploring other lands. I mean, the world is massive. There's seven billion people living in over 200 countries, speaking literally thousands of different languages. But even after 20 years of my life had passed, I honestly still knew very little about the world outside my own little bubble of existence. All I saw of my world were depressing nightly news stories showing me daily images of violence, war, crime, disease, famine, and corruption. So that childhood curiosity I had had just about vanished due to fear, overwork, and stress. That is until 1999 when I went bankrupt and lost everything, including the love of my life and a lot of my good friends. There's something about hitting rock bottom that woke up the kid in me again. I began to observe an unconscious fear and a prejudice that was keeping millions of people living in their own bubble, just like me, from connecting to the world around us. I was shocked to hear that only 20% of Americans even have passports. But I knew in my heart that humanity was far more positive, generous, and loving than the media led me to believe. If I just had the courage to go out and see it. I had nothing to lose. My bubble was now popped. So I called up my best friend, Garrick Hampton, and we decided to be kids all over again and travel the planet by bicycles to really connect with our world. Garrick drew up a design of bicycles that could be ridden either as a single mountain bike or converted into a tandem mountain bike. Our vision was to ride the front seats of the tandem bikes and leave the rear seats open to invite total strangers to become friends as we pedaled around the planet. We would call ourselves the Peace Pedalers, and we had a mission to use these bikes as a vehicle to lower unjust fears and prejudices about the world around us, one rider at a time. That's the magic of Peace Pedaling there, folks. Coming on. Back in 1999, we had no idea how we would realize this dream. Two and a half years later, after spending every single day planning, saving, and working, <laughs> that thing oh my is early. finally realized our dream. On April 22nd, 2002, we rode across the Golden Gate Bridge with our first two guest riders, Richard and JJ. We started out with a test ride to make sure all equipment was working from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Unfortunately, on the second day of the test ride, we had a major mechanical failure. Garrick's frame had to be sent back for repairs. There would be no more testing. The rehearsal was over. Next stop, Japan, the official starting point of the expedition. first bit of news we got was that tandem bikes were illegal on the streets of Japan. We've got the bikes built in single mode um, to get out of the prefecture that we're in because tandems are illegal here. I mean, that's something fascist about that. I don't know. But like all kids do, we ended up breaking the rules after, I think it was the third day. We didn't know where we were going to sleep, we didn't know where we were going to eat, we didn't know who we were going to meet each day. It was just a total adventure second by second as it rolled by. But little by little we settled into life on the road as peace peddlers and little by little we began to interact more and more with the people. Sweet! Oh, that's great. Probably the most profound experience in Japan was we were soaking wet, freezing cold, going over a pass in the Japan Alps. Well, folks, here's our first bout of real rain. And we met a guy named Mr. Yamafuji. He said, why don't you come and stay with my family? He opened up his house, he trusted us with his kids, <laughs> trusted us with his grandkids, and took two strangers in his house for three days. We ended up not only being invited into his family, but into his extended family. We ended up staying with his, his cousin. We started to become invited into the Japanese people's lives. 
boat was leaving Japan towards Korea, our second country. And we looked at each other, and with the sun going down, we looked at each other, and we just realized that this is happening. And that not only was it happening, but it was working. Whew, a full success. Complete success. It was the first time that I kind of started to feel part of the global community. accepted in Korea. And Jamie, hey dude. Back of the road uh, place in Korea. Then you come in here and you find your best friend. What's up dude? What's going on? What do we got, what do we got going? He's bringing us a fork. She's seeing me struggling with my adoption. <laughs> uh, we were treated like royalty. We had places to stay. We were taken out to numerous amazing meals. Uh, given free tickets to midfield uh, seats of World Cup 2002 where USA beat beat Portugal. It was in Korea that I had my first inspiration that it's time to give back. We sought out a, an orphanage in Korea that we can go and visit and give the kids some rides, give some stickers out, and put some smiles on the faces in the communities that were being so nice to us. <laughs> You got it, you got it, you got it. Yeah. I look at where I had parked my bike, and it's not there. Garrick went out to pick up some food for the trip, and we realized that his bike was stolen. I was just, you know, this, 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 this it, they, they'd stolen our dream. You know, this was, without the bike, the whole thing was shot. So, um, you know, I, I, I ended up basically crying myself to sleep that night and uh, woke up in the morning. And, you know, of course, anytime something bad happens and you wake up in the morning, that first hope is that it was a dream. And, uh, it, it, it wasn't a dream. Everyone says, your bike gets stolen in Xi'an, China, you're not gonna find it. We shared our mission with the, with the Chinese people. Well, immediately, the, the newspaper, the print shop, the copy shop, these people in China were just all around trying to help us get uh, my bike back. Got us on the front page of the Xi'an newspaper. So many people read that, that article, and so many people called the police that the police couldn't use the phones. It completely jammed up their lines. The chief of police came, took us out to a fancy dinner and said, please don't go again. We're gonna find your bike, we promise. And they found the bike 48 hours later. He has this big smile on his face. He's not saying anything. And uh, <laughs> I, just, I, I just remember looking at him and just like, really? I, I knew immediately what that smile was. And uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, they, uh, they found your bike. And, uh, I mean, that was just, uh, that was a pretty, <laughs> pretty incredible feeling, knowing that, uh, that uh, the bike had been found. Experiences like that seem to evolve us and open us up to have more confidence to realize what we wanted to really realize on the trip was to have this openness of bringing strangers on the bike and, and seeing what kind of adventures and making friends and, and being kids again, really. Something magical happened for me. I think Tibet was probably the most pivotal country for me because it was the country that I finally just, I just said, no more fear. I'm just gonna go and just be a kid, 100%. And I'm gonna talk to everybody. I'm gonna invite Tibetans. I don't care if I can speak the language or not. I'm gonna go play. Rode up the hill with me. 
and he just hopped on and he's like my second or third of the day helping me make this uh, pass. And it worked like a charm. Karma continued to happen and come our way in, in, in Tibet as well. And some, we met some other cyclists who had hired a support vehicle and they offered to let us put our bikes and, their, and all our gear in the support vehicle so we can mountain bike in the Himalaya region and actually mountain bike up to the base camp of, of Mount Everest. Oh, it Everest. I really felt inspired to, to turn up this giving to the next level, you know. I decided to call my mom. I called her and told her to send up into Nepal a bunch of gifts and toys and clown noses and stickers up ahead and then we were going to find a way to pass them out at, 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 a, at an event that we were going to organize up ahead. Uh, we're here at the uh, orphanage here in Pokhara, Nepal, fixing the kids' toys that we just gave them. We got the same good luck in India and we're able to find a local rider, Raj, and his wife, Nadine, to come on an overnight ride. This is pretty close to the position that the bike went down. There's some fresh uh, road rash right there. Again, reaching out, kind of slowly stretching out of my comfort zone. Uh, I went and visited a school and did a presentation for the, for the students. So I started reaching out a little bit more, but for the most part was just having a really good time. Always wanted to take uh, a blind rider with me to let them experience biking for the first time. So in Thailand, we took some blind riders with us. continue to meet great people, just continue to invite riders to come on and the same level of acceptance of, of riders in, in India, riders in Cambodia and Laos and Thailand. People wanted to come and play. No matter where we went, people wanted to come and play. All I remember seeing is this big tree. So I went back to the U.S. Garrett kept riding. He just when I was ready to come back down and meet him in Indonesia and continue riding, I get an email from him saying that he had crashed into a tree. The pain in my arm was just excruciating, so I realized that something was seriously wrong with my arm. I, I make it probably about five steps, 10 steps or so, and I'm just putting my head down on my handlebar and, and trying to breathe. Got full surgery on his, on his arm and, and uh, broken ribs. The doctor comes out, he, he's, he's got the, the stack of x-rays. He's like, this, this is bad. Find out later that I had a punctured lung. We had a travel insurance sponsor at the time, and that sponsor did not renew our policies for a couple of months. There was a lapse. I failed to tell Garrick about that lapse. Here he was back in the States in a relatively safe environment, and he had gotten himself insurance through another company during this lapse of time. And I was out there on the road, doing all the things that he and I had been doing, so he knew all the risks that happen every day out there. And he had failed to tell me about it. So um, I wasn't really fired up in joining him. Now I was by myself, and now I'm uh, on my way to Indonesia. that you're looking at and we're in an island. So, here we are on our way with Ishal. This is the man. He's taking me to the orphanage. I meet Ishal right away. Just a warm, warm guy. I tell him I want to bring uh, some teddy bears and gifts to the, the local Muslim orphanage and he gets all excited and he gets on the bike and takes me to meet his family and from there we go to the local orphanage. 
and we put smiles on all these the, these kids and, and it didn't matter if they were the Muslim or Catholic or anything, it didn't really matter. They were just kids. Yeah. Riding on into Java, I started to just keep an eye out more now for ways to give. So I heard about the, the, the World Peace Parade going on in Bali for the one year anniversary of the Bali bombing. And I, I just got inspired to, to head out and, and, and see if I can help or volunteer over there. And I went over there and they actually entered me into the parade as a parade float. When I was in Indonesia was when I started to really have a conviction that the more I contributed, the more that I was gonna get in return in the way of, of, of rich life experiences. I went and did an orphanage visit and then someone shares their surfboard with me and gets me addicted to, to surfing. Scuba diving, mountain biking, all those things kind of came to me. I got great deals on all those. Free three days of golfing at a posh golf resort. And so it was like, as I was giving, more things were coming back my way. So every once in a while I ask myself, what are the other perks of being a peace peddler, of riding a bike around the world, doing good deeds and spreading good loving? And today is a perfect example of uh, it all coming back. Check this out. My own private villa on the 10th hole of world famous FINA golf course. This course, I guess, is uh, world renowned. It's good to be me today. When I went into Fiji, I, I could finally explain this to people. And the Fijians got it. They got it right away. They felt it. They heard it. And they responded. This is Joe's first bike experience we just rode. How was it, though? Really good. <laughs> went to go look for some surf and ended up meeting some other surfers. Simon and William. Uh, two Fijian friends that are going on a three-day adventure up into the highlands of, uh, of Fiji, some of the most rugged, steep, muddy, difficult terrain that you can imagine. Up, down, up, down, up, down, non-stop. We were totally exhausted. We ran out of food. We had to use a stick to get up into the fruit trees and grab food for us to eat. Uh, it was one of the hardest expeditions that, that I've done on my whole trip. The derailleur of our bike completely broke off, completely shattered. In the middle of the night, we ended up arriving in the only town there was up in the highlands uh, at midnight and knocking on some stranger's door, completely stinky and smelly and, and getting let in. My first taste of love dig was with Simon and William, you know, really building strong friendships. Still on the, uh, and then it carried on right moving here. into uh, New Zealand. Me and my little kayak outfit here, as you can see. <laughs> see our crew. <laughs> One rider after another, we're just meeting people, meeting people, meeting people, meeting people, and it's just magical because I'm getting referred to people as I go along the way. They said, go meet my brother here, meet my friend here. Phase three of the, of the trio. Oh, <laughs> I forgot the camera at the wrong time. What's up there, Big Ben? Hey, bro. Just uh, nearly, nearly at the place. Definitely the most important thing that happened in New Zealand was when I was leaving. Uh, Andrew took me to the airport and he says, uh, Ben and I both wanted to share some important advice with you before you go to Australia. You need to stop being so selfish. You need to contribute more at these events that, uh, that, that you go to and you like to organize. You're really good at getting people together. You're really good at creating a good energy. You know, everyone loves your energy, but, but, but when it comes time to, to, to cook and to clean and to prepare and to set up shelter and things like that, you seem to disappear or want to take pictures or film. And that's not going to be appreciated. So you got Binks back there, Shelly. Just getting ready to hit the top of the toboggan run. And, uh, Get ready for the ride. With the 
our first time seeing a koala in nature. So we are on day one of the uh, Sydney to Brisbane push. I got a stop and I checked my email. I got an email from Garrick saying that uh, he had unfortunately spent all of his riding funds on surgery and rehab for his injuries, had to sell his bike, and was not going to be able to, to rejoin the ride. He was bailing out of the ride. But he, also, he, he said it wasn't only because of, uh, of, of money, but it was also because of some other things that he was dissatisfied about. And one of the things he said was about my selfishness. It was when I was camping on this beach uh, outside of Sydney that I re really settled in that I was going to be by myself and that I'd lost my best friend and uh, my riding partner. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a really sad night. I remember crying and, and thinking, how am I going to make it on my own? And I ended up uh, taking quite a tailspin. And for the next 18 months after that, was officially off the bike. And it took me a while to, to get my bearings and get my strength back to, to get on the road again. I finally had the, the strength, I had the inspiration again. I learned the lessons of that first part of the ride. From those events that happened back, and the great events that happened all the way back in the first stage of the ride of Asia and Oceania, uh, I learned a lot. And one of them was I needed to, to, to start to give big and not just live big. So out of that became this giving radar. And one of the things that bleeped on the radar was the ability to use this ride and use the experiences and inter interactions with the people as an opportunity to share the truth that our world is not as grim and negative and scary place as many people think. The first project that we did was giving away 100 free bikes to, uh, to a township in Kailisha. Smiles on these kids' face, you know, when people came out of nowhere and just delivered free bikes and giving them a lot of them had never even been on a bike before. We had to actually teach them how to ride a bike. Great day, we've got a lot of kids here. Everyone's excited. We've got a bicycle course over there where we're testing the skills of the guys. Over there we're doing a thing where we're showing guys how to fix punches and inside they're having some fun events as well. They're rapping. They're rapping about bikes. He got led all the way uh, up the coast um, towards the wild coast. We ended up connecting with the Kosa tribe, which is in the wild, wild coast. And the more that we are living this open way, the Give Big came back again with good karma. We got, I got the most unbelievable waves I could ever find. Uh, great people to come out and surf with me. And so there was again this karma, this Live Big, Give Big was coming, but it was coming at a much bigger and more powerful level now. and I became like brothers right away. It was like you can sometimes, somehow there's certain people that you just connect with. And he was able to get a bunch of time off work, but only three days. And it was a special time there uh, because we, we took off uh, our first day of riding and we were so excited. We started working our way up and then my, the hub of my bike broke down. Well, our bike has broken down. We're just ready to go over the Motang Pass and have had a major, major mechanical failure. And this little village is not going to have what we need in the way of tools to fix our stuff. So we're wondering what, what do we do? It's, it's, it's done. Our ride's over. I need to go to South Africa where there's, you know, mechanics to open this thing up and figure out what's going on. Officially everything is not even supposed to be open for us, but somehow, some way, 
someone's watching out for us. We got Israeli music. I'm driving the car. The wheel's being disassembled in the other place. Some other part of this little town of Dixburg. And sun's going down, but we're making it happen. We'll like, keep you posted. Uh, I come from Malkins and now I ride uh, on our journey to Bunya. So I contacted a Swiss manufacturer called, called Novartis in Switzerland and continued to hound these guys day after day after day saying give me thousands of treatments of this and let me pass them out as I'm riding to the small villages that are really far from clinics where kids and elderly die every year because they can't get them to the clinic in time. They've got the right person on the phone and got the right person and they sent over over a thousand treatments of, of Quartum. Can be strapping this, pedaling it down, hopefully take all this bulk and put it into maybe a bottle like this big that I can take out, hopefully save some lives in Africa. So he's got bad, his head's hurting really bad, he's got chills, fever, his whole body's hurting. So luckily um, I'm really grateful that I have these pills um, to give to him to get better. This guy's got some nice legs, nice and strong. Alright folks, we're in Bonda village here. It's a really small little village, far from the quite far from the med any medical clinics. I'm here with Bonda. He, yeah, and he's representing the, the chief who's out right now. So we are very proud to uh, receive this uh, meeting. Oh, these are just beautiful people, huh? They can see them all down here. They're all beautiful. Huh? So uh, I'm happy to help these people out and encourage you to, uh, you know, in your next vacation, find a way to help out the places that you're traveling to over and out. It was while I was in Zimbabwe where the idea, like the, the giving radar that I was telling you about earlier, the giving radar went off again as it relates to music. Because these musicians who used to make money doing gigs and used to have some kind of livelihood now had almost nothing. So the best that I could do to think about helping them would be, okay, well what if I can record and then give you a studio quality CD that's cut that you can sell at your gigs to people who liked your music. Earn in the city time. Yeah, right, let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. It was a win-win. I got to record them for my show, but then they got an actual studio quality CD that was really well done, and they were they were totally stoked. So that became my new philosophy now as it related to music. As soon as I was in Zimbabwe, I said, wow, this is it. This is the ultimate win-win, the ultimate live big, give big. Some live recording in the gorge of the Zambezi River. It's absolutely gorgeous here. And uh, so we're gonna be bringing you lots and lots and lots of good music, good scenery. Just an awesome opportunity to get to know this beautiful country of Zimbabwe. That's how to say let's be friends. I don't know if I'm going to be able to repeat that. No. So he's 59 years old yes. and uh, he's going to give a try here to go help me climb the hill. Let's fix his chain and ride on. So he's teaching me so I have to teach you as well to show you one love here in Africa. Yeah. Zimbabwe, come guys, full of peace, full of joy. Nice. Over and out from the road. 
Here in Zambia, we live in poverty, but uh, we, the children which we have are more happy than the children which are found in UK. Greetings, folks. Well, two things are happening at the same time. One, I've just gotten to the point that my bike only goes to one gear now, uh, which is the little granny gear. Uh, I have to MacGyver come up with some solution to that right now. And I'm also realizing that I haven't picked up anyone on my bike because I think I'm still a bit angry or distrustful towards um, Lobo who stole my gloves. We've got female canyon rider number two, Bentakini. Bentakini and Bianchini. That's my last name, by the way. And Jakob, where are you? Back there? And uh, we were just riding and, and they uh, hopped on. And we're going to their house to stay tonight. It's a good day to be alive in Kenya. Over now. Oh, the kids are coming? Yep. Yeah, we, we thought we were hiding away, but we will soon see. We were far from here. So slowly, like bees on honey, the kids are coming. Good, sir, how are you? I'm fine, fine. Yeah? What is your name? I pull right by this, uh, these school kids and decide to pick one of them up and the, the kid's name happens to be Innocent, that I found to be a really interesting name, his name's Innocent and Innocent hops on the bike and I say, I'll, I'll take you home, let's, let's go. And something happened that day, um, you know, I just, we, we just built this friendship and started talking and I asked him, what, you know, what is his dream, like what's, what's your dream, what do you really want in life? And he said his dream was to start a, a community center or a school for AIDS orphans because there were so many AIDS orphans in, in Uganda. And I said, well, you know, if you really want to do something like that, I'll help you. He starts crying. And he said, are you really want to help me with this dream? I really want to do this. And I said, absolutely. Here's five, I gave him $5. I said, go open up an internet account, right? And then email me at this email address, a one page summary of your dream. In 24 hours, he did it. And then I gave him the next step, do this. The next step, do this. The next step, do this. You know, go and, go and ask for local sponsors. Find the land, did it. Find free cement, did it. Find free materials, did it. And little by little, I gave him steps in every single way. He did the steps, did the steps, did the steps until he had himself built a school. So we got Bang Bang and Binks. We got the crowd above here, as always, uh, coming to root us on. We just did a nice downhill run together and we're close to Kabale Town. Bang Bang, you go to Kabale. Bang Bang. How do you like the ride, Bang Bang? Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, I'm on, he has to say. That's his favorite thing. Yeah, I'm on. You like to ride? A little bit of a language barrier here. Um, the road is there. It's there for me to ride on and engage in this project. But a part of me also, I think, is, is afraid because of what has happened in this place. I still have fear. I see, you know, I can see people with machetes chopping people up. Uh, I mean, a million people were killed here 10, 10, less than about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. And it's just, for me, it's fresh in my mind. You can just feel this eeriness about 
people have moved on, but there's still this weird vibe here in Rwanda and I can't explain it. two nights and a full day of adventuring. So it's time for you to get to know this man, have him share a little about what he's all about on Sue here, and uh, really get to know one of my new friends here in Africa. So off we go. Prepare the dim. Uh -huh, more so. The family, your side there. So, we all the people here, huh? time in 69 years, you never slept in a tent like this, yeah. huh? Plant. Plant. Uh, I was in the, probably the worst physical state I've been in in my life. Uh, I was completely drained from no sleep, coughing like mad. I'm freezing cold in a hot hotel room, which is not a good sign. <coughs> oh my gosh. Uh, I also have massive aches that are really serious, and I have no energy and I have no appetite. It's just gotten worse since yesterday, and it's very scary being alone here in Lomé. So I just took some malaria medication, thinking it might be malaria. If it is, that'll wipe it out. If it's not, then because I've got to let it do its do its course. So this is not the best part of traveling, but. For now, say la vie. And for the first time, uh, I really needed to just really do nothing. I actually finally had time to reflect back on the last 21 countries in Africa. I mean, I had come up through this, this continent with this new attitude of, of, of give big, con contribute, make a difference. And I was really excited about that, but it was wearing me out because I was, I was focusing all this energy on doing, doing, doing. And I lost touch with really what the whole trip was about, you know, and for some reason I just, just 
taken the giving big to, to such an extreme that I, I had forgotten to take care of myself. What became apparent to me was that I needed to make a shift now, turn on some new area of my life, and that area was love. And I needed to have more love for myself and take care of myself, and I wanted to nurture more of the actual personal relationships with people. As I moved up into Europe, I said, I'm going to start to now create this newer philosophy now, which is live big, give big, and love big. You know, and try to come out with some new balance of that so that I'm not just in one, one extreme or the other. Riding in the Italian Alps, fresh from Africa, and I'm ready to go and do as I always do, ride my bike for a bit, and then at the end I like to stop, meet some local people, and see if I can stay with them, meet their family, cook with them, get to meet their kids, and thinking that was okay, but uh, I wasn't in Africa anymore. <laughs> I was in Europe. And little by little, I was kind of making the hint, like I always would do, that I don't have a place to stay that night. I really want to meet the people. I want to see how the Italians live. I'm part Italian. I'm a Bianchini. And I'm thinking, this is going to be easy. But nobody offered me a place to stay. And I end up under a bridge on a bed of rocks by myself, looking like a little vagabond hermit, you know? It was a, it was a humbling experience. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Italy. Today is my first day officially pulling the cameras out. Uh, it's been a bit of administration for a while. I just entered into Tuscany. I was hoping to come here last night, pedal up in about 20, 30 kilometers into Tuscany, and then, you know, introduce you to some people, uh, stay at someone's house like I did in Africa for a couple years, but uh, it just didn't happen. Kind of the first, like, love big experiment really kind of came out when I was in Italy. So the, so the next day I'm climbing up and I said, okay, well I struck out last night, but now this second night I'm gonna really look and try and find myself a place to stay with some families. Again, ask one family no, and ask another family no. Same thing, like they, they looked at me and they're like, I don't know who you are. I figure in a place this pretty, there's gotta be some beautiful Italian people. It's just a matter of time. Right now I'm gonna settle in and enjoy. I ended up having to camp again in a, in a field by myself and was, was really kind of striking out, also trying to find riders as well. The third day I went, uh, I was driving by myself and I ended up meeting this guy Antonio on the side of the road. And Antonio looked at my bike and he's like, what, what, what is this? What are you doing? And I explained what happened and he said to me, how many Italian riders have you had? And I said, none. He said, I thought so. You know, he took me in like family one because he was a traveler and he was somebody who was also a cyclist. But he was the one who kind of shared with me that, he, that I might want to consider letting people know in advance that I'm coming. So I didn't have so many days after days of not being able to be with the local people, which is what I wanted. The area of the Balkans is an area that, that had some war recently, has had um, conflict recently, and so I said, well, if I'm a peace peddler, maybe I can do my part to bring a little bit of peace and a little bit of good vibe, a little bit of healing into this region of Slovenia, Croatia, uh, Bosnia, and Serbia. So I said, one of the ways I can bring people from each country over to the next country. So I was like, why don't you guys come with me and we'll head over into Croatia together. So I ended up grabbing those two heading into Croatia where I met a guy named Svamir. Svamir and I met way back in Nepal and became friends back in Nepal in 2002 and he was welcoming me, me and, and Sonia and Vesna from Slovenia into his house in Croatia.
It wasn't about really trying to do something for anyone. It was just being as, as loving and as caring and fun and open as I could and actually listening to people, asking people how do they feel, asking what makes them happy. So the, the interview questions on the bike started to change. I started asking what, you know, what brings you most happiness in life and why and really starting to get to understand who people really were. And out of that, I think, grew some friendships and some connections that were far more valuable. What is it that gives you most peace and most happiness? Now, the most peace, it's given me. Uh, the, 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 the sitting at home and watching a good movie with my family. Yeah, what makes you happy? Oh, very hard to choose. First of all, makes me happy. It's very, really, oh. Uh, to be with my daughter. Yeah. It's really very good. So, I think it's time that uh, we go hit this water, huh? Ireland has always been a dream of mine and as I began my trip up into Europe as a peace peddler I said okay well there's one thing I can try to hold an intention or a goal going into Ireland it would be what if I can just bring a little bit more peace into that region especially the struggle between the north and the south the Catholics and the Protestants. In the 21st century this is more of like you know what I mean but they think we go to hell because it's a hell place if you believe in hell and no, because we don't go to a true church. We think they're all Jude. All right, so we heard from Protestant Mark on our way through the peace wall here to the other side, to the Catholic side here. Sharing some good giggles and laughs with a boy from Perth. So maybe that's your message to the world is just to get out and do yoga or to know yourself. You know? Uh, my first stop was Brazil, and one thing I didn't speak was por Brazilian Portuguese, so I figured if I'm going to start to make friends and have relationships in, in Brazil, I'm going to learn Brazilian Portuguese. I made a decision to live in Brazil instead of just diving right into traveling. So that uh, I can hopefully, besides this film, also be in and by the time I made it into Uruguay, I was feeling pretty darn good. But once they left, uh, I have to admit, it was kind of like reverse culture shock. I thought I would be really excited going into Uruguay because I speak pretty good Spanish. But for some reason, I was speaking Brazilian Portuguese for so long, I almost forgot how to speak Spanish. And I hit this wall. Plus, they speak a very hard, different Spanish in Uruguay than they do in Spain. Three Uruguayans that came to accompany the Peace Spellers adventure to, where are we going, Rocha? Rocha? Rocha. Rocha and then Sierra de... Now we're back to food. We're gonna have some typical stuff here. Typical stuff. All right, here we go. And I went, made my way into Argentina, and I had an old friend from way back in college named Sarah, who happened to be living there at the time, who invited me to stay with her.
So Christina is a Spanish backpacker from Barcelona and she just hops on the bike and I dress her up and I was going to take her to a place about 16 kilometers away which is a, one of the many Jesuit ruins there. She was going to see another, another Jesuit ruin. We make it 16 kilometers. We're just having a great time chatting away about all sorts of things. She's an acupuncturist and we like a lot of things about the healing arts and we're talking about things. We get 16 kilometers like that and uh, she doesn't want to get off the bike and I don't want her to get off the bike either. We're having a good time. So I invited her to come all the way through to the next town Posadas and then cross the border to Encar Encarnacion, which is in Paraguay. And she says, man, why not? Sounds good. So she goes back and gets her passport and a little small backpack with an extra, you know, extra shirt to come on this little weekend trip over to Encarnacion. So Christina and I, you know, she goes back there. I take the bike all the way to Posadas. She meets me up there and we head over the next day over into Paraguay. <laughs> Jasmine agrees to not only host me but also Christina at her house with her family and it's Father's Day going on there so there, she's got family over, music, food, big barbecue asada. And I knew Bolivia was going to be a tough country. It's definitely, there's not a lot of paved roads, there's a lot of poverty, a lot of high altitude, a lot of tough riding. All right, folks, four hours later, we found our ride. The house of one Rob Roberto Corona. Then I asked him what his dream was and what is your dream? Like, what do you really want to do? And we started just sharing about our dream. And we connected in this one point that, that, that there needed to be a news source, some kind of media source that instead of get always there being negative news, negative news, that there was a news source that was just positive news. Like people could get negative news just through word of mouth if they needed to hear it. But if someone just wants to know what's up in the world but they don't want it to be all the, just the bad news, where can they go? So I, so he said, I, I think it'd be neat to start that. So I said, why don't you start it? I'll help you. And next thing you know, we found websites and we sat there and created this dream that is still going today called Prensa Positiva, or Positive Press. The next adventure is Peru. Uh, we kind of beelined it up to Peru. And we had a bit of a schedule going, you know, and we're trying to get up, up into where we want to be and home by Christmas time. So. Uh, we wasted quite a bit of time and we just beelined it up to Peru and went right to Cusco. And we wanted to do some cycling adventures all around Cusco and some of the smaller roads around Cusco. But we finally made it to the border of, of Ecuador and Peru we, we, when we started riding in the Amazon. And we knew that there, was, there were oil companies, we knew that there was pollution and there was stuff in the media, but we didn't, we didn't we weren't, we're not reporters, we're not here to go and tell people they should be do something better or bad or whatever, but we did want to tell the truth. If there was truth to be told, we were willing to document it and give people a voice if there was something that they needed to say. So we were just kind of being, we were kind of rode in this mission to allow people to get a voice if they needed a voice. Finally, it was time to move on and move into our last country that we're gonna be traveling together, which was uh, Colombia. And we were kind of running low on time, so we beelined it again with bus and transport on the way to, to Cali, and we're gonna start our, our actual cycling expedition from Cali up to uh, Medellin. But the next morning was uh, December 1st, and we'll never forget the day, because it was the day Christina said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm too late. I'm two days late on my, on my period, on my menstruation, and I'm never late. And it didn't seem likely to me that she could be pregnant. And we went to the blood bank and we asked for our results, and the, the little lady gets the piece of paper and she smiles and she gives this to us like this, with a, like a big smile. Um, that I, that would, I didn't like the smile right away. I was like, what does that mean? And then so she opens it up and it says positivo, which is positive. And our plan was to go off to the islands 
and do some cycling uh, as our as our last our last part of our adventures together. We're going to be out on the islands of Providencia and San Andres and, and, and Providencia Island, which are these really tro cool tropical islands off the coast of Nicaragua, which are part of Colombia. So for the next five days, we camped on this on this little on this free beach. It was a, it was, wasn't a campsite. It was basically a, a, a slot of beach in, on a, in Providencia Island in Colombia with coconut trees and clear, nice water. And, and no, there's no establishments there. There's one little small reggae bar down at the end of the beach that we hung out at a lot. But otherwise, we just camped and swam naked and just did nothing but lie in a hammock and chill out. And that was really good for us. We, we, didn't, we didn't talk too much about it. We said, December 14th, we're going to make a decision. We don't going to talk about too much about it. We're just going to be with whatever option may be together. And then on December 14th, we're going to share how our feelings are. And so we, uh, we had an amazing time on the island, met all sorts of great people. And, and on December 14th, we hiked up to the highest, the, the tallest point of the island. So we we're up here, this beautiful view, 360 degree view on the top of this island. And you know, I asked her, what do you want to do? And she said, I, 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 don't, I don't want to abort the pregnancy. I want to have this baby. And, and I felt the exact same way. I just, I never actually really ever felt that any desire to abort the baby. We both felt this was what was meant to happen. And uh, we were meant to be this little, this little child's parents. My goal going through Panama was to get through to, to Mexico and get on the plane to go watch the birth of my baby boy. So life, life definitely changed. I had a couch surfing host named John. He turned out to be the sweetest guy in the world and we immediately made friends and he hopped on the bike with me without problem. Everything started flowing really nice, found music without even trying, uh, great, great talks, made a bunch of great people. He viajado con con bici muy muy largo. No 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 muy largo no. Pero tú me dijeron me ha dicho que ha hecho uno día grande para cruzar la frontera. Sí eso sí. What they say about Costa Rica, everything is true about how just how beautiful it is. They they take a lot of pride in their land there. It is a natural paradise. So I'm riding along and I'm in the town of Damas and I see this, this young boy in a bus stop. I talked to him, told him I was on my way to San Jose and his eyes light up. So I'm going to San Jose too, I need to get there. I set him up head to toe with cycling gear, but I still had this weird feeling in my stomach that said, don't take this guy. You know, gotta use the judgment call. Yo puedo confiarte. Sí. No vas a robar, tengo todo mi cámara, todo mi cosas. Y tú vas a estar conmigo como equipo, equipo desde aquí hasta San Jose. We finally arrive in this, this town of Quebrada Amarillo. I said, let's take a picture of all of us on the, on the port. So I went to the bike and opened up my bar bag in the front, and I, there was no camera there. And I was like, whoa, where's the camera, where's the camera? And I dug down a little deeper, and there's no iPod there. So I started looking for everything that might be missing, and basically, somehow, my iPod and my camera were both gone. He said, I don't have it. He was really numb and indifferent, so I immediately started being a little bit suspicious of it. It's hard to determine when certain things happen, if there's some reason to it, even if they're painful. Age-old message when we were kids, it was to say, you know, there's a bad apple on every tree. Yeah, there's sometimes events that happened in, on my trip, and, and Costa Rica was one example of some of them that would appear bad, but really they're little nuggets and surprise and the, the hardest thing for me to do sometimes is to say thank you when those things happen, but I was getting better at it. In about uh, five minutes, I met my first friend, Pedro, and we, 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 I could tell I was gonna like hanging out with this guy. He just had a really positive energy to him and big, huge smile. And I started getting on the dirt roads, really rough, rugged roads, made my way down all these rocks and things like that. But I get down to the bottom and, and my, my rear rack is starting to rub on my wheel, making this noise as I get down to the bottom. I'm like, That's, that can't be good. And so I stop and take a look at it and realize that one of the two clamps has snapped on the, on the hard riding. And there's no hardware store shops to be found anywhere. You know, there's a, there's a reason why all this happens. I need to find a way to say thank you to this and figure out what it's all about. So I called Pedro back up. I said, well, looks like I'm gonna come back that way. And he was just so excited. 
encontré aquí al amigo Jaime siempre. Él es muy pura vida, tranquilo. Yo vine de Costa Rica y me hizo una pasada. And then that night he said, I've got to take you over to meet my friends, uh, Antonio and his whole crew. Turns out Antonio and I became like brothers immediately. Come on, da. Antonio. Yeah, hey, amigo, mi hermano. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> mi hermano nuevo. Buen viaje. I had a, a local guy named Manu who I had found through a friend of the, I met on the internet named Ori. So I rode my way to Mizata and I get him pretty late there. He said we were going to meet there. I'm calling him on his phone. He's not picking up the phone. And he didn't call. He didn't write uh, anything. So I ended up having to get a cheap guest house down the way and woke up the next morning feeling a bit angry and a bit mad because, you know, someone says they're going to do something, you're supposed to do it. And I showed up to El Zante. The first person I see is Manu, right? The guy who kind of dogged me. And he gives me this big, huge smile, gives me a big hug, and he says, welcome to El Zante, brother. Sorry, I couldn't make it, but let's go get some surfing in, you know? Just like nothing happened. And I just had to realize that's just the way it is in Latin America. famoso. <laughs> Aunque ya soy famoso, mi Jagger. Ran the cameras for a while until the rain came, and then put the cameras away, and we kept looking and knocking on doors. Everyone said either no or couldn't do it. Then the rain really came down heavy. And we're like, okay, we had actually, we have to get shelter. We can't keep looking anymore. So we actually went under this little shelter area. And from there, that was exactly where we needed to be because that's where we met this 20 year old kid named Nisho. Nisho said, come and stay with our family. So we found our place to stay. And he turned out to be the, just the nicest guy. And his family was just a beautiful, welcoming family. <laughs> I asked Nisha, what is your message to the world? He said, my message to the world is that we're all one. We're different and so forth, but in, 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 in the same light, we're actually all the same. We're all one. Alright, so basically you heard this guy's lovely message, Nisha's message. That message is basically my message. It's been 80 countries. Eight years of doing this, and uh, I think I'm about done. And there's not much more I really need to know except what I've learned and where we're at right now, which is we're all human. It really doesn't matter the race, it doesn't matter color of skin. We all have the same needs and desires. It's all beautiful. And something that's kind of settled in with me with that message and the message from his father and what was happening all along with me deciding not to go to the next place. It was like, yeah, we can go to the next place, but that's just going to be another person. We're all kind of connected. So there's no reason for me to continue just going, going and rushing on this next people. And I just said, you know, it's time for me to move on. So I was going to do one more ride. And as I'm riding there, I realized that my bike frame is cracked again and that the rear hub of my bike, by the time I made it there, completely locked up. I wouldn't have been able to go anywhere anyways. So it was another final sign that it was okay for me to stop and not feel guilty about not going to Mexico because I was planning to go to Mexico, but by going out to be with Christina, going out to be with Luca, who was growing rapidly inside of her belly. So this is officially the end of my Latin American tour from Brazil to Guatemala here. I'm gonna come back to Mexico some other time and catch in North America. So I made my way back earlier than planned from from Guatemala to the U.S., got myself prepared, and then made my way over to, to Spain and had a baby. Just my, bit, my biggest bit of travel advice is get out and see the world. It's absolutely stunning, and don't be afraid of it. Just be smart and put your ego away, and don't be afraid to ask people uh, for advice, because really, generally, human beings and humanity wants to take care of you, and they don't want you to get hurt. Nobody does. <laughs> I think Nisha was right. In the end, we are all one. 
If there's one thing I learned traveling by tandem bike around the world, picking up total strangers and making friends, was that we're all part of one family. It's the human family. It's that family that taught me more than any education I could have paid for, or even more than my own fear.